I don't always get on a soapbox and say, okay, this is my mission. I'm going to help people feel good, or I'm going to, I've got this to say, and my lyrics have this to say. I just try to write what's true for me. Uh, and, and if someone becomes inspired by that, then that's a beautiful thing. You're listening to Lives at Speak, a podcast highlighting the remarkable work of Sidwell Friends School alumni. I'm Brian Garman, head of school at Sidwell Friends, a pre-K through 12th grade independent Quaker school located in Washington, D.C. In this interview, I sat down with Catherine Bostick. A composer and singer-songwriter, Catherine is known for her original work on film, TV, theater, and symphonic music. She was recently Emmy-nominated for her score in the 2019 award-winning film, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. Catherine is a recipient of many fellowships and awards, including the prestigious Sundance Time Warner Fellowship. In 2016, Catherine became the first female African-American score composer to be admitted to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. In this episode, we talk with Catherine about working with August Wilson, celebrating Toni Morrison, honoring her own self-sovereignty, and listening to silence. So glad to be here today with Catherine Bostic, an amazing composer, uh, songwriter, musician. Catherine, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And we are delighted to be honoring you with uh, a 2020 Distinguished Alumni Award. Thank you for um, accepting, and I hope you've had a chance to see the video, which I think is a great tribute to you and your career. Well, I'm <laughs> completely honored and blown away by this because um, I didn't see it coming. (laughs) (laughs) I really didn't. There's, you know, I I think of so many of my class members uh, is all being distinguished alumni, to tell you the truth. Everybody is just so incredible. Well, we're fortunate to be able to honor you. And again, thank you for being with us here today. Uh, I can't wait for this conversation. Oh, I'm so honored that you guys even thought to do this. I really am. You know, it's, it, it, Sidwell has always been such a part of the way that I have gone about my life, actually. And I didn't even really, I didn't really intellectually understand it until I got out in the world. And there's this energy field that I find that Sidwell encompasses in terms of, it's just so, it's such a nurturing environment. It's such a, a giving environment of letting you sense that the sky's the limit like you you're capable of doing anything and even if you don't even if you don't know that at that time especially when you're young and trying to figure out your life or not even trying to figure out your life you're just young and you're in this very um exploring and experiential kind of place there's something in the environment of Sidwell that is extremely fertile for that kind of growth and unfolding. And I didn't really understand the depth of that until I got out into life. And I, 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 I experienced the contrast of that, if you will, mm-hmm. the, the, the mindset that was full of naysaying and, and, and fear and, and what you cannot do. And, you know, just, you know, life is always going to present itself in ways that are a lot more um, at times severe than, you know, when you're in school, you're in this bubble, you're sort of insulated in, in any kind of structure, whether it's family or school or what have you. But with Sidwell in particular, there's such a nurturance. And I'm, I'm so grateful that it's a part of the foundation of who I am mm. be, because it, it really has provided me with a sense of, well, well, but of course, Mm. but of course I can pursue these things, but of course I can have inquiry about, about my life and about exploring what that means for me. Of course I can. It's, it's not even, um, it's just second nature. And, and that's why it was so important for me to, to be on this podcast because I wanted to express that deep appreciation that, that I genuinely have for what Sidwell provided for me. No, you're very kind. You know, I wish um, 
that I could give you the hug that I normally get to give you when I see you. <laughs> but yeah. it, you say that and you share that. And even before we started to run the tape, you, you shared this beautiful story about wonder that to be in your, in your presence is really to be, I've always felt um, with someone who is extraordinarily centered, um, someone who has a, a deeply creative and spiritual aura, where, where does that spirituality come from? What is your source for that? Wow. You know, it's a very, it's a very profound question because sometimes I, I do think about that. And I, I have to say that music has been the teacher in many ways, because first of all, it's so intrinsic in me. It's such a, a, a natural and beautiful gift that I have. And so it's taken me through various um, journeys and experiences with people from all over the world. And even when my intention was more focused on, you know, um, getting a gig or being rock and roll famous or, you know, being around rock and roll famous people, even when it was more sort of uh, in, in, in a more sort of mundane uh, place, which, which is all, all of it's, all of it's relative. There's, there's not, to me, there's no hierarchy in, in the unfolding of life. And so music, because it's so vast and because I have such an appreciation for it, the vastness of it, has allowed me to appreciate access. And when you, when you appreciate access, you don't have room for anything less than that. You don't have room for confinement or constructs because mm -hmm. what you're ex being exposed to and what you're experiencing as an artist and as a musician, and you can talk genres, you can talk, well, this kind of music really appeals to me and this kind of music. And, and the essence of music in and of itself is visceral. So that visceral connectivity began to grow within me. It just, it, it became such a, a force. And, and, and to become aware of that is a presence that gives you access to an endless way of being self-expressive. So in that, I know I'm kind of maybe talking a little abstract, but I don't really know how to answer that question. <laughs> I think your answer is beautiful. I, I, so part of that inspiration uh, with music came from your parents, right? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. My mother was an incredible concert pianist and, and composer as well. And she, she had studied at Eastman School of Music and... Um, at a time when it was very rare for African Americans to study classical music uh, in, in a conservatory of that caliber, and but she never talked about it that way. She never talked about the difficulty of that, and she she just talked about how much she loved music, and this is something she wanted to do. And she bought right after she finished, she bought herself a Steinway piano. And that was the pride and joy and centerpiece of our living room in our house. And she would play and practice for hours. Um, her compositions, William Grant Steele, George Walker, Ravel, Debussy, Hindemith, Bartok. You could, the list goes on. I mean, she would just, she would just uh, sort of camp out at the piano. And, and so our house was always full of music. And um, all the women on my mother's side were, mm -hmm. were musicians. And who were the influences outside of your family? Uh, where did you draw inspiration from those who came before you? You mean in terms of music? Yeah, you other, or... music, you other artists. I mean, you, you, you not only are you an extraordinarily visionary artist, but, but you also um, have found a, a way that you are constantly interacting with other artists to bring mm -hmm. their work and their uh, life into um, our deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I can, that's a good question because so much about life in and of itself is, is what 
inspires me. Um, I can say that uh, musically, uh, well, I know Mrs. Cleaver. <laughs> Mrs. Cleaver <laughs> inspired me yeah. because she was so passionate about her service of music at the Sidwell community. And uh-huh. The yeah. musicals that she would create and the, the holiday season music that she would you know, galvanize everybody to, mm-hmm. to perform. And mm-hmm. it was really powerful. But I think, I mean, there were so many artists uh, that I grew up listening to uh, from, let's see, at that time in the 70s, 80s, I mean, you had such a range of artists who were activists in mm-hmm. their work, mm-hmm. who were trailblazers, you know, ranging from Earth, Wind, and Fire, Joni Mitchell, Marvin Gaye, mm-hmm. um, you know, in terms of the, the kind of music I grew up listening to. And for me, it's being around people who are just consumed with passion for mm-hmm. their self-expression. Mm-hmm. People who have a sense of autonomy mm-hmm. in that self-expression. Um, and I can tell you that when i for instance, I had the good fortune of working with August Wilson um, on uh, Gem of the Ocean. And right. it was in that process, not just because of the amazing gift and talent that he embodies as a playwright and as a, as a griot, but just his way of committing to that calling had an impact on me. So that's an interesting term, griot, right? And uh, which is uh, a, invokes a particular kind of tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see yourself in that tradition? You know, I think I think in some ways I do. Maybe I don't see it full on, but I do see myself as a person who has a kind of overview uh-huh. that 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 I like to share from, that I like to to live from, and if. If in that expression, you know, I can I can trigger something in someone else because I think in many ways we all have that capacity to be a griot, to be to be someone who who, who is informed and then passes that along. And informed in a deep sense, a kind of spiritual sense, a cultural sense, right? Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely, about, absolutely. I griot. mean. A tradition of a griot, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. And I think, I mean, intrinsically, I've always been a very, you know, I say spiritual, but even that word, I, 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 I say it carefully because so much is attached to words these days, and in general, there's so much messaging going mm. on that requires very, very. Uh, special insight and 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 my motto is to question everything because the ultimate goal for me is how does that how does that feel for me how does that feel for my self sovereignty how does that mm. work itself in my life so that my moral compass and my sense of respect for this gift of being alive is intact. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very careful about words and labels because they're they're, they're used in ways that fuel constructs and remove an essence of presence that music has taught me is absolutely Mm. necessary to access. You see, that's what I mean about music being this incredible teacher because Mm -hmm. the music that that I write, it's such a, I write such a range of music and I'm really, I call it cosmic dictation. I'm really just getting, you know, these, these downloads of of inspiration and insight. And, and maybe that in that way, I'm a griot, uh, a sonic, a sonic griot. (laughs) Well, that's all part of the tradition too, right? Um, Music is part of that tradition. Um, That's right. And and but so I'm I'm interested in your process. What is that like? What is it when when you when you are presented with an opportunity to score? Take us through um, your creative process through a project, if you would. 
Sure. So, um, well, music for me is conversation. You know, it's, it's, it's a sonic conversation. So typically when I get, uh, say, a film project, um, uh, for instance, let's talk a little bit about the movie I scored, Clemency, mm-hmm. which stars Alfre Woodard and um, is an incredible movie. And, is, and well regarded, right? 20, uh, 2019 Sundance Grand Jury winner, right? This yeah. Is, this yeah. is a major work of art we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's really phenomenal. And the director um, wanted to convey uh, with a cold eye the, the parameters of the uh, prison system and, mm-hmm. and, and, and without weighing in with how you should feel about it she just wanted to present the facts, a day in the life or a week in the life of this warden played by Alfie Woodard and the toll in being the one who deals with the rite of passage of uh, death row inmates. What, what kind of toll does that take on her psyche and on mm-hmm. her life? And what kind of toll is that environment for everybody? So the, 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 the music, um, the director wanted it to be very, very sparse and typically when you have a film, you sometimes you'll get the script, I'll get the script, but everything changes once you get the visual because that is mm-hmm. how you're going to be informed about how to have music enhance the emotional cadence of a scene or you know how it's going to land, how, how it's going to elevate that content of that scene and, and the overall arc of it in the movie. So this movie was edited without any music there was no typically you have what they call temp music so that when you're cutting the scenes you have something to cut to so they they'll either use music that they feel suits the tone of the film or they'll they'll ask the composer they'll they might ask me oh what do you have pre-existing that we can use to sculpt the film before we really get into the meat of it And that's called a temp score, meaning temporary. So this movie, when it was presented to me, it was two hours and there was no music. So I had no point of reference in terms of finding the tone. So I had to really, it took us a while. It took us a while because the director had become used to silence. She had become very, very, understandably, the prison environment is very stark. There's nothing warm and fuzzy about it. So any kind of tonality she felt could be over-emotionalizing or over, it could be tipping the hand or tipping the senses to feel a certain way. So it's very, as you know, music is so, it, it, it's so sensory oriented. It's so visceral, as I've said. So anyway, it was a very challenging score, probably one of the most difficult I've written and mainly because I had to really understand how delicate the placement of the music was. So I began to listen to the environment, you know, the prison environment, the footsteps, the coldness of the, the, the austerity of that environment with the metal clanking of the door, the, the cell doors opening and shutting, and the, the, even though there's echoing in this vast cavernous place, there's also something kind of, I'd say like a dead echo. Like the, you, there's no, you, there's no resonance. So I had to figure out what is going to be, what we call the palette, meaning what are going to, what's going to be the sound, the textures, the instruments. What's that going to sound like? And initially, um, the director wanted a lot of vocal textures to reflect the warden's inner struggle. And, and that was interesting, but I thought that might be a little bit too much uh, in terms of a score. It might be too heavy handed. Mm-hmm. But what we ended up doing was using a few vocal overlays and I chose some ambient metallic kind of uh, textures that had some tones here and there. And we just played around with it. Now, whereas the Toni Morrison film, that film, the director, Timothy Greenfield Sanders, and and the editor, Johanna Giebelhaus, basically 
they just let me do my thing, mm -hmm. which is very rare. It's very rare. Usually you have a lot of people weighing in with their notes and what their intention is, which is as it should be. It's, it's their vision and it's a collaboration. But the Toni Morrison film, the moment I saw that open, it, it, it has the way it's edited, the way it's cut, it actually has a rhythm to it. And I began to feel that rhythm and I began to feel this swagger, plus her voice. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Her voice alone is so majestic. It's such a, it's so powerful. And so I wanted to frame that and not get in the way with it, but I wanted to, to have this, okay, I wanted the music to have like a summoning kind of a quality mm -hmm. to it. And so that's why I started off framing around her voice very just sort of sparse little okay gather around people because you're about to go on a journey that is going to be beyond memorable and powerful yeah. <laughs> and so I just I watched the cut and the cut had this swagger to it and they had told me they liked upright bass and they liked some earthy kind of elements at that point I began to have conversation. I begin to ask myself, more than even talking to myself, I begin to think about how I'm feeling. Because the music is more, even though it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's about what you're hearing, it's more about what you're feeling. It's that kind of a sensation. And so I just begin to, uh, I call it a musical divination, frankly. You know, mm -hmm. I began to get informed about what that was. And I saw this community uh, of, of musicians coming together and the music basically wrote itself, even that entitled song, High Above the Water. I had written another song that, that I was very fortunate because typically the entitled song is the big moment. And that's um, in terms of selling a film, often a director and producers will want to get a big name artist to, you know, have the defining moment song. And, and they, they had some offers from like some mega, <laughs> I mean, mega stars uh, for that end title song, but they wanted to have a consistency with the score that I wrote. And they knew that I, that I sing and write songs. So they asked me to do it. And I was very uh, honored and thrilled, obviously. And I had written sort of an anthem to Tony. And then at, high above at, water, right? No, no, no. no. Four at perfect. no. I I had written something different. And then at four in the morning, that community of musicians, that 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 fellowship, it was this. I just started hearing those this old school piano kind of revival kind of feeling um, about right. about like elevating your spirit and and having this this ability to be uplifted uh, back into a place of, of comfort and solace and peace. And she describes it in her Song of Solomon, where the ancestors from the slave trade, as they were being brought to this country, the ancestors came and elevated some of the slaves off the ship and brought them back to Africa. And that imagery was so powerful. Mm -hmm. these, these, these African American angels, these African angels rather, coming to get their family and take them out of the pain and misery. And so I started just hearing that song um, based on that imagery and that feeling that feeling of, of being transcendent, being able to, to transcend this, this horrific situation. Mm. You call you earlier, you said that um, sometimes when you're writing, you experience it as a kind of cosmic dictation. Mm -hmm. Was that one of those moments? And if so, what, what does that feel like? How did, how did, how do you experience that? Um, yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> one of those moments. And, you know, I experienced that a lot. It is, wow, how do you put that into words? For me, it's so, it's a sensation that is, um, 
you you just have to be open. You 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 know, whenever I write music, it it it's such a fluidity. There's such a fluidity in writing music. So I'm always able to receive without getting in the way of that. It, you just have to be very present. You just know. It's just a knowing. You just know that this is what I'm to do right now in this moment. Mm. And I find the best the best of my, my work has come about that way. Mm-hmm. So it really is divination. I mean, it really is. It's a real ability to be so present and to be so removed from a thought process of how is this going to work and how is this going to land and to just experience it. You're just experiencing this communication, this conversation that you're having. So for me, I do it with music. You know, sometimes I'll sit and I'll play the piano and I'll start because it's such a tactile experience. And in playing the piano, I will start to hear a conversation based on emotion. So with the Toni Morrison song, High Above the Water, I started hearing those piano chords, old school kind of church in the country. Mm hmm walk, you know, side to side by side, two-step choir. And then I I also knew that the water is such a powerful element in her storytelling. Mm -hmm. The water has tragedy in the water. There's carriage in the water. There's rebirth in the water. So the water became this baptismal element in the way I wanted to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I began to just invoked the character of who was telling that story. And it was, it was this old soul, you know, old woman telling her family members about the water. When the crimson moon, there's a shine on the water, high above the water. And where secrets, where secrets lie. So I wanted to have it as, um, this kind of presence of someone who is invested in the history of her people mm. and, and of her tradition. It's so evocative. Uh, and and um, I was thinking, um, you know, the River Jordan, um, I was thinking about spirituals, um, and I was thinking um, even a, a, the Middle Passage to all of this is so That's right. Present in what you're writing. And it's so um, evocative of Morrison. Uh, yeah. And, and you, cro- you capture uh, the power of her words. I mean, here you are charged with representing the life of one of the greatest writers to ever live. Is, do you feel daunted when you're given that task? <laughs> How do you get past that? You know, I mean... <laughs> I mean, it definitely, when I first thought about it, it was absolutely daunting. But then I just decided to, let me try to get into that energy field yeah. that, that yeah. I perceive as her. What, let, me, let me have, again, the word is access. Yeah. When, you, when you have huh. access to, to the vastness of energy and possibilities, then it's not about you. It's not about your fears. It's not about your insecurities or your hubris or your need to make a statement. It's just about pure access. Mm. And in that moment uh, of really yielding to that, that's when the magic happens. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't so much about thinking about the intimidation of you know, working uh, yeah. on a film about Toni Morrison or working with someone like August Wilson. It was about accessing what inspires them mm-hmm. to be who they are and to, 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 to write what they write and mm-hmm. to create what they create. Because that access is something we all have available. Mm-hmm. So, and the, be- the beautiful piece of, I mean, first we should say that uh, High Above the Water uh, was shortlisted for an Academy Award, right? That, but, so you, yeah. you did tap into something that um, that people wanted to to experience, right? 
Yeah. Um, and 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 second, like the the guitar, right? The the, mm -hmm. the blues guitar, right? It, and and I'm thinking of uh, the character guitar, uh huh, the song of Solomon. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, just yeah. just beautifully integrated and. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very, very powerful piece. And let's say if we could go back to the um, August Wilson, right? You, we, I think when we were just catching this, um, before, actually, I think we were talking before we began the tape, and and uh, you were talking about getting the email to uh, work on the PBS documentary, documentary for um, docu documentary for Wilson. Um, could you tell us that story again? Oh, you mean for Toni Morrison? No, that was for Morrison. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go back yeah. to that. Yeah. Yes, I was, um, I was uh, going through my emails one morning, and one of them, uh, when I opened it, it said, oh, we would want to know if you'd be interested in um, writing the music for a documentary about Toni Morrison. And at first I was like, what? Wait, you're asking me, a qu you're asking me that question? Um, and it was just... It was so beautiful, not so much because of the obvious gift of being able to to write for a film about Toni Morrison, but the the way it was delivered to me was with such reverence, you know, and I thought, wow, you know, if they're coming at me like that now, we're going to have fun because we, we, we were all wanting to come with reverence in honoring Toni Morrison. And that's what we did. Everybody showed up with this extraordinary appreciation and understanding that we were, we were given the gift to create something magical and impactful. And, and so there was a lot of, um, we were humbled by that and we were reverent and we all co-created. Mm. And because of that awareness, I think that's why that film is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. in, in, of course, in, in relationship to it being about Toni Morrison as well. And you, you um, had the opportunity to actually work with August Wilson before you did the score for uh, that film. Yes, that's right. That's right. But I mean, to your point, back to the Toni Morrison real quick, I wanted to say sure. that okay. that... that the word I used about getting that email was having the openness of wonder, being right. being able to being able to know that life is it, it's always about the unknown. That's that's the actual truth mm -hmm. about life is that you don't know moment to moment. We don't know anything, and so the more comfortable we can get with that uncertainty especially now which is a whole nother story but in that email you know people are like oh did you get that through your agent did you get that because you know so and so i had never heard of these people mm -hmm. who found me i don't know how they found me but they found me and sent me an email mm -hmm. so this kind of openness that i've been able to cultivate over the years has provided me with incredible opportunities your comfort with the unknown seems to have so much to do with your openness um and and you mentioned that th this is a different kind of time altogether it, it, there's so many uncertainties that we face right now are, are you finding that this moment is having a particular impact on your art um, have you been drawn in any particular directions because of the context? Yeah, it's funny because I have been, I've always been sensitive about change as being th this incredible force. <laughs> it's, a, it's a force of life, it's change. And so this time that we're in is epic. It's an epic change. It's an epic epicenter of all kinds of dynamics to shake our consciousness to a place of, of awareness that can potentially be beneficial and expansive. So 
I've actually been working on my record uh, of songs. And I started working on this before the pandemic, about maybe a year before the pandemic. And a lot of the songs deal with change. And at the time, I said to myself, I said, wow, you have a lot of, a lot of these songs are about catharsis. Don't you think you need to chill out a little bit <laughs> about that? Because it's getting a little heavy handed, everything you're writing. And now I understand why um, I was being led to write those songs. Mm. So I'm, I'm able to have music also as sanctuary, if you will, at this time because it is it enables me to have a choice about my focus about what I want to create and as a result of that I'm being asked to create with a lot of different organizations that are we're sort of meeting each other on that 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 common ground of creating something that has that speaks of this time but also has authenticity to to one's own voice mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned um, use the word word self-sovereignty earlier um, mm -hmm. in the conversation how, how do you go about finding that self-sovereignty in a moment like this for me self-sovereignty is about showing up in my life in a way that is honest and enables me to have an appreciation for life, even in the middle of all the chaos and all the struggles that we're going through now. And to question the belief systems that to me have put so much of these constructed ways of being in place. You can talk about racism, you can talk about injustice, and they have to absolutely be discussed. They have to absolutely, there has to be a change. There's been systemic racism, systemic imbalance, socioeconomic, everything. There's been this warped perception of, of our lives that has sucked the air out of what humanity for me really is. You know, I mean, the fact that a person's skin color can define how they are to live their life is a, one of the most absurd things that I can even imagine. And, and, and we keep recycling the same narrative without really looking at the belief system that put it in place, that the belief system that deals with constructs and the belief system that would deal with an illusion of hierarchy. So that's what I mean about self-sovereignty. How, what, what is the role of the artist at a moment like this, right? I mean, artists have lots of different roles, right? But there, there is something that, that, that you, you have um, worked with artists, you have honored artists whose work is uh, politically engaged, perhaps through its consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see yourself in that tradition or, or do you? Right? Or what part of that tradition speaks to you and the work that you're doing right now? Well, you know, I think being an artist is you have the ability to touch people. You have the ability to affect people on an emotional level, especially through music. It's mm -hmm. the most, to me, one of the most pure and, and, and sort of primal, instinctual mm -hmm. response mechanisms. So you have the ability to influence people's feelings and if your mu if the music or the lyrics you're writing can trigger a, a kind of a, 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 an awareness or a healing or um, an inspiration then that's a good thing you know and I don't always get on a soapbox and say, okay, this is my mission. I'm going to help people feel good or I'm going to, I've got this to say and my lyrics have this to say. I just try to write what's true for me. Mm -hmm. And I try to show up with that kind of honesty. And, and, and if someone becomes inspired by that, then that's a beautiful thing, you know? Mm -hmm. 
I think if you if you put uh, something premeditated. I mean, sometimes you have to. Sometimes I'll be asked to write something with a specific parameter. But even in that, I want to invest myself in that process by being authentic. Mm -hmm. If you were to look back over your career, which has been just amazing and continues to be so, um, and you look back to uh, your 16-year-old self sitting in a classroom at Sidwell Friends, what advice would you give yourself? <laughs> That's funny. I was thinking about that the other day. Um, I would say to my 16-year-old self, I would say, you know, you're all right. Uh, you're all right. You're just fine. And you have a beautiful life and more to come. And you're just fine. I'd like to invite Natalie um, and to ask a question or two if, if she has anything on her mind. Um, Natalie, uh, do, do you have any anything you'd like to, um, Catherine, to comment on? Um, gosh, there, there's so much. But it's, so, it's so rich, I, isn't it? <laughs> I am interested in, in moving through this space. Um, where you don't define yourself in in certain boxes and by race, but other people do, and how how you've managed to assert your view of it and your self sovereignty um, throughout both Sidwell and professionally. Well, I don't I don't deny or dismiss you know my race or my experience in being an African-American woman. I just don't look at it as the sole lens of how I'm defined. I think mm -hmm. that, I think that so, as I said, so much of the messaging is topical. Mm -hmm. And so much of what is not served is the value of autonomy, the value of one's unique purpose, mm -hmm. the value of one's unique individuality that you then bring to the collective that can enhance the expansion and, and, and be of service from that place. Mm -hmm. And I think that even the messaging, as I say it over and over again, you now have people of color and BIPOC, Black, indigenous, people of color. Do you say people of white? Why don't you say people of white? Mm -hmm. The term white privilege. Why is it a privilege to be white? It's not a privilege to be white. The privilege has been in the fact that there's been access because of perverted legislation. So I think if you're going to talk about these things, you have to talk about the belief systems behind them. Mm -hmm. um, the term white supremacist. There's nothing supreme about being white. This, these are acts of terrorism. And if we're going to, even the term racism, it's not race, it's not, it's color. We're talking about pigment. How shallow and superficial is that? So I think things have to be called what they really, really are. If you're going to have conversations about these, these are constructed parameters that are continuously recycled that create a smoke and mirrors reality that robs oneself from oneself because underneath all of the, the topical definitions of race, gender, sexuality, age, whatever, religion, whatever, whatever the little box that you want to check, underneath all of that, is the underpinning of, of who and what you really are. But the focus, the way we're conditioned and socialized, is to compartmentalize to such a point where, to me, as I said earlier, it's just sucked the humanity out of our sensibility. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work for me. You know, I, I, I'm not dismissive of the injustice. 
I've experienced it. I've experienced racism, ageism, sexism. I've experienced all of it. And um, it's not pleasant. And it does make me very angry. And it does make me very sad, even more than anger. But what I always question is why that conversation is, is so baked into the psyche that it continues to happen. And that we never talk about the belief system that puts it in place, the belief system that there is a need for hierarchy, mm. which is an illusion. And mm. we're living it right now. This pandemic, it's affecting everything and everybody. And if you can't see the common denominator and the common ground we all share in the midst of all this crisis, then, then there's something wrong there. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful answer. Um, it's a, and it's evocative and, and thoughtful. And um, I feel like we're um, in, in many ways, in the, in, in fact, we are in the presence of a great teacher. And, and maybe you could speak a little bit about that, um, how you approach uh, your work as a teacher also, because I know that's another component, it seems, of who you are. Well, it's kind of something I kind of backed into. <laughs> I don't I don't consider myself a teacher. I just have opinions. <laughs> I just have opinions. That's how I like to look at it because I'm very sensitive to this, you know, coming off like I'm proselytizing or that I have uh, something that, you know, I just hope I trigger things in people that mm. make them question, that make them question. I just, that's, that's how I want to show up is, you know, have you ever thought about it this way? Mm. And, and if not, that's fine too. For me, as I said, I, I find that there's not, th that the way we're conditioned is so external. It's so externalized about, well, I've got to, I've got to be in this group and then I've, I've got to get into this school. I've got, in other words, I have to look outside of myself for constant validation and it's an unfortunate handicap of self-perception. People talk about, you know, wanting to have a seat at the table or wanting to have this and that. And I'm like, that's your birthright. That's, you come in, you come in already with this incredible arsenal of everything. And, and granted, there is a lack of opportunity that is based on all these things we've talked about, race, gender, on and on and on. But I'm talking about before the constructed mindset that came in to implement those things, you've come in with an arsenal of possibilities. And that's not taught enough or ex expressed enough. And that's what I mean about self-sovereignty. Just one one question to sure, ask you too, in terms of the musicians you've worked with. You know, I'm sitting here in my daughter's room, which is serving as my office. Mm -hmm. um, and you've already heard the dog, so you know <laughs> that I'm working from home today. But the the book that is right next to me is "How Music Works" by David ah, Byrne. That's yeah. And I know you spent some time working with David Byrne, who who is a Quaker and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a very um, provocative musician, very uh, uh, creative person. What was that relationship like with David Byrne? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I worked with him as a background singer um, years and years ago. You know, he he's always been someone who marched to the beat of his own drum, clearly. And, and I think that's one of the most remarkable things I learned from him, you know, He's a very unique artist and um, an activist. And at the time, as I said, there's a lot of things that I was probably too young to really understand the magnitude of them, but they still impacted me anyway. And working with him uh, was, was amazing. You know, his, his songwriting and his style and his lyrics are unique to him. He's an innovator. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, was, that was great to be around. Experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I just, uh, um, how about the John Hyatt connection? That was incredible. Oh my gosh. I worked with him back when I lived in New York. They used to have these unplugged sessions on, um, I think it was 54th Street or 57th Street. 
and um, you know, these are people who he, these are people who just embraced who they who they are as artists, and 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 knew that their music was impactful. And his songs are just completely they're just it's evident of that there's they're, they're he's so prolific and he's a very humble and um quiet kind of presence you know he didn't have a lot of the bravado and bling that that can so often accompany people who are successful and who are iconic he just shows up being who he is and i think that's that's what i mean about the importance of autonomy you know just keep fueling the essence and, and, and truth of who you are. And that, that's, that's the foundation of purpose. Hmm. That song crossing muddy water is unbelievable. Do you know that song? I do. Phenomenal. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So we got to get you in the studio, Brian. Well, you, you don't want me anywhere near the studio except to watch you. That I would love to do. <laughs> I would love to watch the creative process, but you don't want a microphone anywhere near me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what what about but what about Nas? Oh my goodness! I had a friend who was producing him, and they needed um, an opera kind of vocal treatment because I do I I do session work from time to time um, as a vocalist on some movie scores and things of that nature. And again, another person laid back, very much about their art and their their activism through music. Um, his dad, Oludara, same thing. These are, you know, a lot of these artists come by it by way of, by way of generational uh, legacy. It's in their DNA. Right. And, um, and I, I feel that that, that's the gift of it, you know, and for a long time, I, I did not want to pursue music because I was wanting to do things that were more conventional and traditional and uh the music was is just too it's too big it's too big in within me that i can't i can't deny it and once i embraced it my my life changed for the better actually obviously <laughs> what are you listening to these days oh my goodness <laughs> what do i have time to listen to i'm i'm doing so much composing and too writing much. Too much writing. I, Too busy. I, I'm so busy. I, I have a piece premiering with the Chicago Symphonetta next week that uh, I'm rehearsing with. I have two film scores and a bunch of film projects that I have to focus on. And then I'm trying to finish my record in the middle of all of this. So sometimes I'm, I just take a break from music. <laughs> I'm listening to silence and the, and the birds and, you know, nature. <laughs> Are you near the piano? I am. Would you sing something for us? <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, well, I'll do it a cappella. How's that? Okay. My piano. Uh, we'll take, we'll take anything, the, any performance that we can get. Uh, that would be great. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'll sing. I'll sing a little bit of my song "Safely Home" because I feel that that song could be important right now. Come away from troubled waters. Turn away from darkened skies. I will guide your sons and your daughters and carry them safely home. Safely home we will go. Rest gently through the night. Safely home we will be on this journey. Safely home. Safely home. When the moonlight starts to glisten over land and over sea, I hear you call and I listen. Carry me safely home. Safely home. It's beautiful. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Brian. 
it's uh, so great to connect uh, with you. I'm, I'm so grateful um, to have spent this time. And one of the things that I always say about artists is that they teach us to see the world in new ways. And I want to thank you for opening your heart and opening your mind and opening your entire creative self to us in the Sidwell community and for teaching us a great deal today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor for me. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so there's no hug. I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> I just have to say that every time I've had an opportunity to talk with you, I just so enjoy it and feel like I am um, in the presence of a philosopher. <laughs> right? You're just so thoughtful and, um, and, and such a wonderful uh, teacher and presence. So thank you. Well, thank you. Feelings mutual. Thank you. Thank you.